Today's guest is Robin Richardson. She is a licensed psychotherapist practicing in Sarasota, Florida. She had a near-death experience as a child, and she incorporates elements and understanding of her near-death experience into her practice. And today we're going to learn about her near-death experience and her life after her near-death experience. Robin, thank you so very much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Jeff, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me to speak about my experience. I think the time is really a great time for humanity to be hearing about these things. Yeah, I agree. My audience loves to hear about near-death experiences. So can we start with yours? Yes. And what I'm going to try to do is give you the big picture uh, and then we can elaborate on more details if we need to. But just to give it into uh, a nice, quick understanding of what happened. So the, there was a pandemic flu uh, that swept the nation. Um, it was the Asian flu back in 1957. And I was just a, a baby, six months old. And what happened was, um, I guess it was mostly taking out the elderly and the babies at the time. And my mother had went to work. I had... Uh, I'll give you the understanding of what I was able to find out after to put the pieces together. But my mother had went to work. My babysitter had actually contracted uh, the Asian flu and was in the hospital. So my mother was concerned about me, but I didn't have a temperature. I was acting fine. So she went ahead and dropped me off at some, it was a couple's house to, to babysit me while she went to work. And what happened was and this now I can tell you is what I experienced as the baby. And it's very unusual to have an infant have a near death and be able to have total recall. And I'll go into that later as to how I have a full understanding and recall the event in its to totality. So take you back a journey in time, back to the 1950s. Do you remember well, you probably don't, you're too young, but there was a kitchen table and they had the, the like great big chrome. And I was in a little baby bouncy carrier. And I know that because I could see myself and I didn't have good vision because I had already contracted rubella. So my vision was already out. So I had a fuzzy view of what I was seeing as a baby, but what I saw will bring into clarity everything else that I was able to sub subsequently find out from my mother. So I was in a baby carrier. I had two people that were at the other end of the room near a corner and they were talking to each other and they were very upset and they kept looking at me. And remember, I don't understand English. I don't understand words, but there was very staccato and I knew they were really upset. So I was, I had my eyes glued on them for what I could barely see. They were fuzzy, but I knew they were upset. And I knew there was something brown on the wall. But now think about it. It was an old fashioned phone, but I didn't know it at the time, right? And it's fuzzy because I didn't have really good vision. And so I knew they were really upset and they were upset and they were looking at me. So that's how I know what my body looked like. Because I finally understood, because I was trying to say, calm down in my head, like, what's wrong? And I realized they were looking at me. The attention was focused on me. And when I looked down, I saw my little baby hands and realized that it was me that they were concerned about. And I'm thinking, there's nothing wrong. I feel absolutely fine. I feel wonderful. And at that moment, I could see light shimmering from my hands. And the best I can tell you to give you words in the English vocabulary that would describe what happened next would be like light beams filled with little champagne bubbles of love. Mm. And they literally scooped down if I, and I was right like this and it scooped down like a light beam and just scooped me right up out of my body. And in just in a few seconds, I was lifted up out of the apartment. I could see, now this is what's interesting. I could see my mother, I'm up out of my body, 
But in those two seconds, as I'm rising up, I can see her running from the doorway down into the corridor, screaming, where is she? What's her temperature? At this point in time, I understand words. I understand English. I know what everyone's saying. I know what they're doing. And she's saying, pack her in ice. And they're going, it's 105. So it's very interesting that I understood words at this at that moment. I was lifted into the stratosphere, way above Earth, way out into space. And it was almost a freeing event. I was, in, I was shackled by constriction. And all of a sudden, my consciousness expanded. It would be like taking a bag off someone's head. And you could see the world and you could feel the world. And it was as far as you could see, the vista was that beautiful. And I almost took a breath of like, oh my God, that's wonderful. I'm so free. What was interesting is yes, it was in space. And at that moment in time, my consciousness extended outward. I knew that there was a planet there. I knew I could see everywhere, but then my consciousness turned around and said, that was an interesting experience. I can think two thoughts simultaneous. And I was very curious. I said, that's interesting. Simultaneously, I can think two thoughts and know and understand both. And then all of a sudden, what happens if I can think four, six, 10? And my mind started thinking and expanding into all different things that I could see, that I could know. And at that moment in time, it was like my consciousness expanded so it could think a billion things at once, all at the same time. And the consciousness could interpenetrate, become anything it so desired. So it would be like a computer opening up, a, let's say, a thousand different windows. And you're the computer, your consciousness, but everything is open and you know all at once. And all you have to do is open one window and you can literally become all that is from the inside out. And when you're inside of that thing, you know it fully. Totally. And I believe that that's what Genesis is speaking of. When God was upon the earth, he knows everything. When you can merge and become inside of it, you become it. There's no room for error. So I could feel and know all that I was seen and wanted to become part of. And in that one moment with my consciousness expanded, seeing and feeling and all the windows are open and it was, it was magnificent. There were dimensions within dimensions. There is no emptiness. So it's all dimensions are, are interpenetrated and it extended till there was no end. It was eternity. So I was able to feel the vastness of eternity and everything was growing. It was becoming there was energy that it was like the pulse of our God, our creator. And God is such a, a small world word for the expansiveness of the consciousness that fueled all creation. It sounds like that you kind of just plugged into the universe, into everything and God, like kind of like a oneness. But what I find fascinating is when you were speaking about you could have multiple thoughts at the same time, up to almost like a million or a billion. Were those your thoughts or were you plugging into everybody's? It was mine. So that's why people always are afraid somehow that they lose their self. I did not lose myself. And there was something so much greater than me. There was a pulse of love that we are made in the image of the creator with our heartbeat. So just imagine my consciousness is into a thousand, a billion things. I could still feel what was going on in earth. And I'll get to that in a second. I knew everything that was happening. I knew all the words that were being said. I knew what was happening. 
I could still see the glories, the dimensions, and feel them of all the heavens, of all the universes. It just kept going. And I was still me. I could feel an experience at will if I chose this other dimension or this other particular energy. But there was an energy beyond that that was coursing throughout all creation. And it was a love that that is really no words could define the beauty and the magnificence of it. And that's why they would say maybe God is unknowable. He is knowable. He's so intimately knowable. Maybe we just don't have the words on earth to encapsulate exactly he, she, the energy, the consciousness that pervades all that ever is and was and will be. And it's a love that's so profound. I could feel galaxies, the energy come through and flower things to life. That br- that was like a breath that breathed life into everything and it grew and it became. And then as it petered out, you see, then another breath, another energy pulse from our creator came through and things just changed and became even more. So I would say that God to me is even more than what all the religions have ever spoke of. What made me just have an interesting thought was most NDE people, when they have their experience, they feel this immeasurable amount of love. And love is, I guess, also associated with energy. But I'm kind of wondering, is love really a big enough term for it? You know, like, why do we associate it with, I mean, it seems like it's more powerful than even love. I would say that love is just one aspect. Mm -hmm. It was so beautiful, Jeff. There aren't words to tell you the magnificence that's on this other side that we're a part of. And when you say the oneness, the oneness is, at least from my standpoint, because I think when we die and we cross over, we bring our level of con- uh, conceptualization with us and our level of energy. So maybe my experience was something different than someone else's. Just as valid, they're all valid, but it's where your energy is. And to me, the love, the, the unity was that I could become you. I could become the stars behind you. I could become the desk. I could become the planets. And when you become it, don't you love it? Aren't you at one with it? You are part of everything, but you still kept your own, at least for me, my own consciousness, my own identity. So at that time that I'm experiencing all this, Remember, if you can think and know and have a thousand, a couple of thousand, a million, what your thoughts, anywhere you wanted to expand, it's as great as all the stars that your mind can conceptualize. At the same point in time that I'm seeing all these universes grow and become and be energized and then come down and then grow and become, I could still feel and know everything that was happening on earth. And I was able to bring back my mother's nickname. I was able to say who the people were. I was able to bring all this back. And remember, I'm not even a year old. So that's where this is interesting to me to validate the experience is that I couldn't have heard this. No one would have told it to me. And I couldn't have understood it, even if they were speaking about it. As a, as a child. So my mother, I had seen her briefly as I was exiting earth. And I could feel her coming down the corridor and, and screaming about this red basket, this red laundry basket. And back then it was hard. It was hard plastic. It wasn't the little, you know, wire plastic ones we have today. And so I knew what they were doing. Even if I'm seeing the glories of the heavens, they had put me in this red basket full of ice and, you know, we're talking among themselves and they were all upset, just like they were upset when I was on earth. And 
I, to me, when I was in the heavens like that, it was like a gnat, like I, I want to be disconnected. I don't ever want to come back to earth. Please don't bother me with that. I was too busy seeing everything else, but it wouldn't go away. And it was insistent. So at that one moment in time, I could feel my mother and I could hear them say this, Stormy, she's dead. Let her go. She's going, no, she's not. And they look, there's no breath. There's no heartbeat. I could hear and know every single word, which is, that's what I think. How do you understand? I knew the language. I knew what they were saying, what they intended, everything. And so at that moment in time, my mother was frantic. I could feel her. And I think this is important for people to understand that when you do go to the other side, the other people can feel your energy. They know, can feel you, can feel your thoughts that you can send them love. I could feel she was torn up. She was upset. She was frantic Was would be the word. And so then she crumbled and I could feel her crumble, accepting that I had died because they had showed her that my heart wasn't beating. She crumbled into a fetal position near that little red, you know, laundry basket full of ice. She crumbled. She went to accept it. And all I can tell you, Jeff, she got angry. This, you talk about a mother's love. She was angry angry as she could be. And she screamed my name so that it literally ricocheted into my level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And she went, Robin, get back here. Mm -hmm. And it reverberated inside of my consciousness, even if I was looking at all the dimensions and feeling them. And that was the moment. It was like a fish hook and it grabs me and that's now where I plummet down this tunnel everyone speaks of. And it was lightning fast. And you, I mean, just coming right back, like you have the planet in the back of the back of your image there. Mm -hmm. That's what I would have seen. But then in a, just a few seconds, you're back into earth, you're back, you know, you're seeing the landmass, you're seeing the apartment. And then I almost laughed. I'm going to tell you... <laughs> I saw coming in this little baby body in this red bin of ice. And I said, there's no way it's going to contain my light consciousness. It, it's not going to be able to contain it. So that, that was hubris. That was a little bit of the arrogance, right? So I just can't, that body is not going to contain that level of consciousness like a lightning bolt, right? I entered through the top of my head, went into it and came through and it it was just like this. And for three seconds, I was going, I can't believe I'm in this body now. I mean, I'm thinking this going, it, it actually contained me? Are you joking? And I'm going, well, that's pretty amazing. And it must've been at that moment. This is what's also interesting. I'm still keeping that level of panoramic scene as well as feeling, I could feel everyone's thoughts and know what they were talking about. So I'm in shock, basically back in my body going, I can't believe this baby body contained that lightning bolt of consciousness, trying to get used to the fact that I'm inside the body and feeling my fingers again. And I can see and feel and know what they're saying right behind me. So my mother's right here. Now my eyes are still closed but I know she's here and these two people, this man and woman are behind me. They're talking, going, hey, Joe, what are we supposed to do by the way? We call the morgue or do we call the doctor or like this has never happened to me before. And they're talking about what are they supposed to be doing with this dead body, right? My mother's sobbing and I'm still trying to get used to the fact that I'm here in the body. And then all of a sudden I feel that woman's eyes upon me. And her heart went, oh, my God, I could hear her thoughts. She didn't say anything. I could hear her inside of her head go, I, I thought, think, I think she just moved and she's not believing it. And all of a sudden she, she sees it again and she bangs this guy next to her and says, and he looks and, and she goes, Stormy, Stormy, I think she moved. Before my mother even says a word, I hear her in her head. Don't even get me going there. 
I, I just accepted she's dead. I, I don't even let me even believe she might be alive. And she says, no, Stormy, I mean it. I saw her move. She twitched. My mother brings her eyes up. Remember, I'm in ice. So my arm must have moved again. And my mother's heart sang. It literally sang with joy. And she literally picks me up by my shoulders up out of the ice. And as she picks me up out of the ice, my eyes go to open. And Jeff, it was like this black helmet just came over my level of consciousness. That that panoramic vista that I could understand and see things, I could know language, it just shut, shuttered it. Hmm. So I literally got to feel it come off. And then as I open my eyes, it sh shuts it all down again. And so I, that's what I thought was interesting. And that's why I was able to bring back some more information because I could understand English or the thoughts or what they were thinking and how they were thinking. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I never spoke about this until I was eight years old. And what happened, it was almost like, um, like a person that had amnesia because I had to learn how to speak and do all this stuff. Always had some gifts, always had that ESP. I had, I could see energy. I could feel people as even as a child. And there, that red laundry basket, my mother was toting from place to place to place. And I would get just, just really nervous. I, I, I would get near it and I could feel some energy. Like I, I, so I didn't, know what to make of it. And what happened, it would be like someone losing a memory. And then you know how the, like the psychologist will give them a picture and say, can't you remember? So what happened is I would always stay away from that thing because it would make me feel funny. And my brother was with cloth diapers, I'll make you laugh. And I'm eight. And my mother's telling me, go run downstairs and get the cloth diapers out of the dryer, right? Because they didn't have papers back then. And I ran down and there wasn't a laundry basket. And so I thought I was home free. I didn't have to do that. And I could go out and play with my friends. Mom, there's no, there's no laundry baskets. You'll have to wait. No, honey, there's that red one behind the water heater. I knew which, where it was. I didn't want to get it. I you know, kind of trudged down real slowly because I didn't want to touch that thing. I went to the water heater. I pull it out. It, you can imagine it's a white dryer. So you're putting the cover down. What am I doing? I'm putting that red laundry basket up under it. The same image that I would have seen coming down from heaven. So it's that that ignites it. And I almost fell over because it went from my consciousness from earth in that one moment, everything got unveiled again and I was coming from heaven. So, I mean, if it flip flops where your consciousness is, I remember the entire event and I come upstairs and I said, with of course the, the diapers, I said, mom, did I die in this basket? And picture this, she's 1960s, <laughs> bouffant hair, the little apron, right? Mom, did I die in this basket? She dries her hands and her face goes white and she sits down and she can't even speak. And she goes, how do you know that? And I go, did you call me from heaven? And she started crying. She, I couldn't even get two words out of her. And she says, I can't believe that you remember that. And so finally, when she settled down a little bit, I, I said, why were there two people there? She says, you know that? And I said, yeah, who were they? They weren't you there. I wasn't anyone I knew. She said, that was just this babysitter kind of stand in because your, your real one was in the hospital from the Asian flu. And she told me she'd went to work. She got a call 15 minutes later. They had said my temperature skyrocketed up to 105. She rushed back home, and it was at that time she said, I, I was placid, my heart wasn't beating, I wasn't breathing, that's why they were packing me in ice. So she then gave me the specifics. I didn't know who those two people were, and I knew also that 
I didn't know what that brown box was, but then it highlighted for me later that was that was uh, an old fashioned phone because by that time in the 60s we're on you know more portable phones. So that's my experience. And you know, there's been many other transformative experiences behind it. At that time when you recalled everything and you told your mother, did you have all these other details of being in heaven? I mean, this whole experience, did you remember it immediately right yes. then, everything? Or did totally. you learn nope, about that? Later? I didn't have to be hypnotized. It was instantaneous. I had full total recall. Of all of that. So when you were gathering the basket and and you looked at it, did you stay there for a few minutes and sit there and remember all that? or, or It would it- be almost, Jeff, like you remembering something like your birthday when you were five years old. Mm-hmm. Like all of a sudden someone gives you a book, maybe that they signed their names and oh yes. And all of a sudden it comes back. Mm-hmm. That's how it was, but it was actually visceral. I almost fell over (laughs) because my consciousness went from here to up in heaven coming back. It was like that. So immediately I went to that point in time when I was coming back into the body that that memory enacted the fuller memory of seeing that red basket with ice. All right. Once you regained that memory and all that experience, did it stay with you forever? And you've always, since that point in time, always could access that memory or did it fade? Sometimes it can fade if I get busy doing other things, but I, it's, it's almost, if I choose to think about it, it's there. Exactly. And I think it's also easier for me to access those realms because it's like once you go there, it's like a road. You know how to get on that journey and take that road back home. Mm -hmm. So that's it's no different than picking up that bicycle and riding the bicycle again. Um, While you had the experience, you didn't mention meeting any entities or beings, maybe God. And if you did or did not meet anybody there, did you have any more spiritually transformative experiences in your life where you did encounter God or Jesus or any other entities? Yes. So let me, on when I'm on in heaven, I was able to feel there's no empty space. So there's levels of energy of consciousness. Every, everything's filled with it. I didn't see humans. I was, my experience was more celestial, more cosmic. I was seeing and feeling all kinds of energy, but it wasn't angels per se. It wasn't a person per se. That was way back on earth. Mm -hmm. So there was the difference. God, fountain of love, this pulse of creation, was in a billion trillion different things. And I'm looking at those things, not just the one thing here. So I think I got a more fuller panoramic view maybe of the other side because I wasn't so attached to earth or I didn't have a life journey yet so that I would have been called to look at those things. So I was a little bit freer being a baby to go where I went Um, what it has allowed me to do is first of all, I will authenticate to you that I believe angels or whatever it was, light beam, light consciousness, that's what came to get me out of my body. I felt God on the other side. What I have seen subsequently on earth was that I literally, maybe because I was so young and open when I was five, I literally saw Jesus materialize in front of me. And I think part of this is I would really like the, your listeners to to be more open to little children when they speak, to be more open when people speak of feeling angels or Jesus, 
because these things can happen. And from the child's perspective, no one believed me. Mm-hmm. You see? Mm-hmm. And, but I, you know, you can imagine uh, I'm five years old. I hadn't even started kindergarten yet. And I had a little twin bed and I really hadn't gone to church. So what's interesting is you have me very spiritual. My parents weren't. So they hadn't really taken me to church or anything. So I must, the only thing I can think of is I must have went to church with a babysitter because I, I have no memory of going to church with my parents. So, but I must have, I had to have heard about Jesus. So I was praying by just like this as a little child, five years old, and I was crying because I couldn't believe that they had crucified Jesus and I had called him my Jesus. And I was praying and I said, Jesus, I said, I, if I, and you can imagine a little five-year-old, if I was there, I wouldn't have let them do that to you. Mm-hmm. I love you. I, you know, I love you. Please, I'm so sorry they did this to you. I love you so much. And it was that love. You want to put a term on that. That love was so extensive, expansive and pure that it literally, I felt it go out into the ethers. And remember now I have the path. I, I know how vast the universe is. So I'm, I'm sending that call to Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jeff, I could feel a consciousness go like this. It could feel it notice that thought. And all of a sudden, it was as fast as I was able to come down to earth. I feel Jesus's energy, his consciousness coalesce. And it was cold, like if it's in the vast cosmos with like particles everywhere, it's coalescing and becoming firmer. Do you see? And it's coalescing down through the ethers and it comes right in front of me. And it's so bright that I, I can't, it's blinding. And I turned my head and it was like, he felt it. I could, he acknowledges it. And he then coalesces behind me. Hmm. And stood there and the whole room was radiant with his light. The strength, the compassion, the knowledge, the purity that he possesses is beyond anything that's ever written about him. He's even more beautiful than you can imagine. And that light it, there's a purity of it that we can't even know here on earth. And he literally placed his hand on my shoulder and I was able, it might've only been a couple of moments. I felt him remember, cause I still have that. I could feel his very being and it there, there's a beauty and a magnificence And I can tell you, you don't, I never had to have faith. I know with certainty that Jesus exists Mm -hmm. and that he's that beautiful and magnificent that he could listen to a small child and come to comfort her, that he was so touched by that pure love that he came to visit her. And even that should tell you how beautiful of a soul how divine and gorgeous that that energy, that essence of him is. Mm. And it was only a moment. And then just as suddenly as he comes, he leaves. But I knew, I saw, this wasn't in your third eye. I have seen Jesus many times in my third eye. No, this was light in the room. And so, yes, I can tell you, I know Jesus exists. And I didn't have to go up to heaven to see him. Mm. He came to me which I think is even more beautiful. Yeah, that's an amazing story. It appears to me that you've established some kind of connection with heaven. Do you feel like you still have this kind of connection? Yes, there's been many times when I have needed what I would call that twin sight, that support, that pathway back. Because life here on earth is a, a little 
hard sometimes. And yes, I think it's like a road that you can trod that makes grooves. And so, yes, I can go to those levels. Do I sometimes in life as we get so busy working 50, 60 hours a week and we're so immersed in the physicality of this world, but when I need to and when I can just quiet myself because I've been there, because I have felt it, I can feel it again. Can you, Jeff, remember where you were when you drove your first car and what it felt like? Yeah, it's kind of a faded memory, but. <laughs> but see, that's what that's like. Mm -hmm. You see? So as soon as, as all you got to do is think of the car, think about that driver's license, you see, and you remember it, and all of a sudden you're there. Right. And if you use it a little bit more, you see, it'll come back in its full glory. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's like. And the, you know, there's been times when I've had to call on heavenly help, you know, many times through life's journeys. And it has been there to support me in many ways. There's one time that I would like to share with you. And I was only a teenager. And you can imagine as a teenager to try to understand all these things and not have anyone to talk to <laughs> that understands you. But I can remember that I literally, and this was a transformative experience. You asked, can I reach those levels? Yes. I was only meditating. I had a little candle. I was meditating. And in just in a moment, I was lifted up above earth. I love that picture be, because that's exactly what I saw. <laughs> and I was lifted up above earth and I could feel all the emotions, all the joys, all the sorrows, everyone chattering. And I could feel all that. And then I could feel my consciousness, just one point of light. But it was really lonely because as I went further, I was out in dark space and there wasn't anything else. And it truly felt lonely. And so then I, like I did when I was on the other side, I took my consciousness and extended it further to see, is there anything else out there? There wasn't, and it really calls up the emotion within me because I'm really lonely and I am almost compelled to reach out further and use that energy. And at that moment in time, I could feel just one point of light, one point of light of consciousness pulsing. And it was, it made me feel overjoyed and I could feel it and it acknowledged me. And I reached out further and further and all of a sudden I could feel these points of consciousness like lights, like stars mm. pulsing with their own frequency. And it became music. It was as far as you could get in each star, each point of consciousness of, of our own energy pulsed a certain frequency, you see, because that's who we are. And it became the grandest cosmic orchestra ever there was. It was absolutely beautiful. And that's got to have been what Pythagoras was speaking about when he's talking about the music of the spheres. I think it's even more, do you see, than the planets that he was talking about. We, we are our consciousness. That's the music. And we can feel each other. Interesting that you say that. It made me think that we need social interaction, companionship. Yes. I, I even when I went up there into the dark space, I was lonely. Mm -hmm. And we're not made, made to be alone and isolated. And that driving force was how I pushed my consciousness out further because I didn't want to be alone. Mm -hmm. And to feel just a recognition that you're not alone. There's another point of consciousness that you can feel and know and, and to have that companionship. And that's what it is, whether it's companionship on earth or in the stars. We need that. I think from the other side, that's where I think one was the sin is, is it is when we talk about the fall, it's the disconnectedness 
to the unification of everything that we're all connected. And we're not just these disembodied individual people that only live for themselves. We're a part of this whole vast cosmos that's beautiful and we're supposed to be connected. But we don't have to lose ourselves in that, but we have to enjoy each other and, and understand that life is a learning experience. It's all an experience. But no, I don't think we're meant to ever be alone. You speak about all the stuff about the cosmos and it keeps bringing this memory back to me. Recently, my son and I were looking at a picture, I think, of just one inch of the sky taken by the Hubble telescope. You may have seen that before. And within that one inch, there's thousands of galaxies. Billions of toys that keeps going on and on and on. Yeah, just in a one inch, there's thousands of galaxies. And I was telling my son, you know, in each one of these little galaxies that you see, there's... A, a thousand million stars and how many planets and the earth keeps populating and populating. And I don't know if are we reincarnating or we're just cycling from star system to star system, planet to planet. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, before I forget, and I will answer the next question, because that's a really good question. I wanted to tell you, because I was trying to think, how could I conceptualize what I felt on the other side, we must have seen the same thing. If not, they used that part of that clip where they took that and they just kept expanding it. Cause I was watching a documentary and they had a microscope and they went all the way inside your body to the, the minutest cell and then the ganglions and how it looked. And then they opened it up, opened it up, opened it up. And then they took that must have been when they went to the, the Hubble telescope and then they expanded it. And you realized that the nucleus of your cell and, and the ganglia and the neurosynapses was just like the spiral arms of the Milky Way. And it, then it kept expanding even grander. Hmm. That is what we are. God is inside of us with the universal laws exhibited. The galaxies were made of stardust right here. Hmm but it's an operation and it keeps expanding. Like you saw on the telescope, it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. And I think that's the magnificence of this with the population on earth and why we have so many more souls inhabiting earth. Cause that's what that is. I think it's cause it's the opportunity is there for them to in other previous ages and aeons you know, people were dying so much earlier. So the opportunities weren't there. If they were, they were very brief. People would die in their, you know, 15, 20, 30. And so we have more opportunities. So I think we're souls and they see the opportunity on earth and they're having at it. And it was not just that there's more souls. The souls are all there. I think that they're learning, they're becoming, they're growing. Everything is continually growing. They even can show that with the Big Bang. It continues to grow. So that's what I felt on the other side, that it was just ever growing, ever expanding, and things would change and then morph into something else and expand and have an experience. So I don't think we're creating maybe more souls as much of it is why they're coming to earth. It's just the, there's many more opportunities. Maybe we only had 1 billion. Now we have the opportunity for 2 billion so that you have all these souls or spirits saying, Oh yeah, well I'll try earth. So that's how, you know, it's like an amusement ride. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay. I'll try earth. Now that's that roller coaster <laughs> of life. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try that one. I'll buy a ticket for that. Yeah. So I believe you incorporate elements of your NDE in your practice, but do you believe that your NDE, did it play any role in you becoming a psychotherapist? I think my life uh, that I lived uh, because I wanted to help people it influenced me more because um, that this I can tell you, my NDE my experience with Jesus, I always felt that I was called to serve God and to serve in, I was hoping maybe with religion, with, as a child. And I think that's would have been my driving force. And I was going to a Southern Baptist church 
And you, you can imagine this. And I went up to them being only 11 and said, I feel like I'm called to serve God. How I would like to, you know, be able to serve him in any way imaginable. Could you give me some guidance? And she went to the elders and they came back and said to Mary a minister. Hmm. <laughs> so you ask, do I go back to source to get my knowledge? So I knew that that wasn't the answer, Jeff. Hmm. And I went into deep prayer and it's like this knowledge that just comes pouring down into you. And it said, you can serve me anywhere in any capacity, in any occupation, whether you want to be a doctor, whether you want to be a next door neighbor, whether you want to be a best friend, whether you want to be, you know, a fireman, it doesn't matter what capacity you serve me in. You serve me well when you touch people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to be constrained with a particular religious dogma. And so when that opened up to me and I said, well, then I can serve God in any function I so choose, just do it well and do it beautifully. So I knew I felt a calling to serve always to serve humanity, to serve animals, all creatures. And that's what lit me up from the inside. I became a therapist because it was the an easy venue to do that. And, and also because hypnotherapy is a very good way to access those deeper theta states for healing. It, it's a good vehicle to ride down into that state, that deeper meditation, that where you can enact some of these beautiful gifts that I believe that we're endowed with naturally. I think we've just forgotten some of them. So that if we can get to that point of pure calmness and remember that we are made in the creator's image, our consciousness can then either soar the different levels right, of dimensions to find our loved ones, or can it not turn around and heal our bodies, you see? So in many, it's a good vehicle, and I use sound and music, and I have this vibration bed with water, and then I can pipe my voice into it. And do I use my gifts? Absolutely. Because there's times when I just shut intellect off and feel the presence and just say, tell me what this person needs. Let me be the vehicle. That's higher than any intellectual pursuit. Mm. And it has an understanding, that knowledge that far is far superior to it. Do you get people as patients that have recently had an NDE? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Some of the people either haven't spoke to their family members. I was able to figure this out with a, another patient and his brother must have had an NDE because I kept hearing, well, he's changed. He's not the same person he was. I don't know what's going on. His temper, and, and I finally recognized and asked enough questions that he had, well, he did, I asked a question, was he, did he have a surgery? Well, he coded. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, wait a second. Have you ever thought about this? Could you ask him that? Sure enough, right? That, well, no one had ever asked him if he'd seen heaven, you see. But I've also had other patients that had transformative experiences and others that have died. And it's a benefit to them to be able to even talk to someone about this because so many family members or friends, they're cohorts at work can't understand or don't want to understand or it's too much for them. So they keep it inside. So it's really good for them to be able to speak to someone who understands. Um, and it's like an unleashing of all that energy and they finally feel heard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're doing is so important, Jeff. I can't tell you, you want to talk about loneliness, how hard has it been for all of us who've seen these things, have know these things, and no one wants to hear about it? They they either want to shut their minds off. I I, I don't want to know. Well, what are we supposed to do with that? It, it was sort of like back to the future. If you were in the future and then you got teleported back, and you're living in this world that's 500 years in the past, 
you happen to know about internet. You happen to know about antibiotics. You happen to know all about these things. And no one wants to hear you. What are you talking about? That's crazy stuff about antibiotics. No, the people are just going to die. What do you mean there's germs in water? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know these things and they can't hear you. So that was my frustration. And that's what I really want to commend you for doing what you're doing. And I want to commend IONS. I want to commend all these people willing to come forth now to speak of these things so that humanity can glimpse what the other side is. Do you interact with the public? And what I mean by that is like, do you have a Facebook page or a website or Twitter and where people can ask you questions and you answer, or are you more of, more of a private person? Well, what I'm doing now is I'm just now starting to get out there and speak a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. um, and I work, you know, five to six days a week. I do, I will go out and I, um, I'm a minister at a, a, the Cosmic Church of Spiritual Light. I will go in person and uh, do some sermons and lectures. I am doing it on Zoom so that it's going to YouTube. I'm doing a little bit of that. And I'm just now starting to speak a little bit more with IONS about some of these things. No, I haven't written a book yet. Um, I can consider maybe going a little bit more public uh, but would have to have a little bit more time to do that, to devote to that. And so I'm just now beginning, think of a, a butterfly coming out of, you know, the cocoon, just now starting to think that it might be okay to begin to speak of these things that, that we're now at an age where people can receive them. On any of your literature for your practice, do you make it known that you've had an NDE or do you talk about that with your patients? Was that something that you wouldn't want to talk about? Well, what I've done, I've learned how to work both worlds simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So I can be very um, professional and none of this is on my web page. Mm -hmm. And so I figure uh, like Jesus said, for those who have ears to hear and those who have eyes to see, for those who are in the realm that I'm speaking, they'll hear about me mm -hmm. and they'll come to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, At this point in time, I can work with all echelons, all populations. I'm a trauma-focused therapist. I also do anxiety, depression. I do hypnotherapy. With, I've got 17 years. I do really in-depth, concrete hardcore therapy, but I also do very spiritual stuff. And for the right person, Jeff, they have to be open. And if they're open and, you know, I can't guarantee it all the time because it's the dance between two people. It's like two chords of music. But if they're willing, sometimes some of my patients, when we can get them to that level, if that's what they want to see, sometimes they've seen their child on the other side. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they've seen people, their dads or moms and have had conversations. Sometimes when they can't do it, sometimes I feel the spirits. And, but I can't always say it. I don't advertise that. It's not certainly something that I specialize in, but you ask how have the gifts been? Well, sometimes they will happen mm -hmm. on their own spontaneously and been able to feel, you know, the spirits of deceased ones. Um, and so that just happens, you know, almost accidentally, but yeah, I'm not advertising it. That's, you know, I'm, I'm even reluctant to speak of these things. Uh, but I figure for those who are interested, they're going to be listening to these types of things, then they would be the ones um, that would call me, can go to my website or whatever, but it's not something certainly that I would be advertising to the world. Well, I appreciate that you're still out there speaking about this, like with me and other people, because it still could get around back to you. They're like, hey, you know, Robert Richardson, right. did you hear what she said? I don't know if you want to see her. 
Yes. And, you know, that's why I'm not much. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on any of the Twitters. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm doing it selectively. And I'm hoping that it'll get to those people that really need it, that want to hear of these things. I guess I'm walking on the shoulders of some other people like the PM at Waters, mm. you know, um, Dr. Evan Alexander. Mm. When those people start speaking, it's starting to open the doors. Yeah. And I want to lend credence to them and open them even further. And at this point in time in my life, I'm going, what else more could you do to me? Mm. It would be different if I'm in my 20s. I'm not. And so maybe that gives me a little bit more courage to, to bring that out, but it's not something that I'm craving or wanting, but I'm doing it because I feel called that I want humanity to know these things, Jeff, before I'm not here. Mm -hmm. They need to hear it from a person. They need to truly understand. They don't have to fear death and who we are as magnificent lights, magnificent beings of consciousness. And so that's my gift. That's the legacy I'm trying to leave behind so that you can hear my words, not just now, but after I'm no longer here to know that we exist on the other side and they don't have to just read it in a book. They can hear my words and feel my energy that's coded with that knowledge. Robin, unfortunately, time flies during these podcasts, and we don't have much time left. But before we go, 2020, as everybody knows, has been a very difficult year, and there's been a lot of people leaving, to put it politely. Mm -hmm. So um, can you give us some positive words, a positive message to finish with? Life here on Earth is just an experience. Make it as filled with love as you can and know that all the people that you love, their consciousness exists on the other side and not only exists, they can feel and know and experience and touch you. And so be open to that and we can learn. We're all in this together. Just like what I felt on the other side, we're all together. We're all growing. So we as humanity can, can grow through this together and we can learn, but we do have to reach out to each other, whether it be with other gifts. Can you solve this puzzle? Maybe humanity will be lifted to that level where we will reach out globally with all humanity, with other countries. One person may have a part of the puzzle here, another person a puzzle here, but we all have to connect and use our consciousness that is divinely inspired and to, to look above the, this matrix. You know, we are, in, are called to have our own intelligence, our own critical thinking, and to have love in our hearts to reach to solve this puzzle together. And I know we can do it. Thank you for that. And thank you for joining me. You've been an amazing guest. I really appreciate you being here and I hope you write that book so I can at least have a reason for getting you back um, because I'd like to have you back again and I'm sure we could talk about a lot more. Right. But you are doing an amazing job, Jeff. Continue, please. What you're doing is touching many and that's what your mission is. It's mm. beautiful mission. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. And have a great evening and have a happy new year. You too. We're going to have a wonderful, that's, we're going to conceptualize together. 2021 is going to be a fantastic year. I like that. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.